Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? That was somewhat lackluster. It's because all the kids left the room, right? I like Cornerstone. I am thankful for Cornerstone. I'm thankful for all of you, although you may not know it. I am glad that this is a friendly and warm church. And I know I tease everybody about it, but I am glad that we're so friendly and so happy with each other that we block doorways because we want to talk to each other and care for each other and all those things. And, and actually, I, w- I only tease about it because it's a good thing. If it was a bad thing, I wouldn't make jokes about it. And in reality, when I see the doorway back there or in the other room all clogged up with people and other people trying to get through, it makes me smile. Because I am glad that we love our church family here. I appreciate it because we're commanded by God to be loving and caring for each other. But I think we know, all of us, that that command to love and care for each other is not a command that all Christians completely get. In fact, the church I grew up in, in that church, there were quite a few people who were not friendly, caring Christians. And I know that as I say this, that the church I grew up in is actually this church. However, time and the difference and the atmosphere separates this church from that church so much that I, I, in my mind, I view Cornerstone as an entirely different church from the one I grew up in. And some of you here are old enough to know what I mean. And just to clear the air, none of you are the ones I'm talking about, about when I grew up, the ones who weren't the friendly, caring Christians. But I bet, as I said it, you might see them in your mind. In fact, uh, in the church I grew up in, if you were a brand new visitor to the church, when you walked into the sanctuary after you found a nice place for yourself to sit, you would be greeted by a member of the church. And while that seems friendly, the greeting was usually followed by, you're in my seat. (laughs) And oh my goodness, the congregational business meetings. Before of each of those, it was like preparing for battle. Because they usually were war. I am glad that we have grown so far from that, that today, not even doorways are safe from our friendliness and care. I am glad that we are a family. And if you're here right now and you don't feel like part of this family, uh, I'm sorry you don't right now, but let someone around you know, and you'll probably get overwhelmed with too much friendliness. But not every church is like that. Not every church is a friendly, caring church. And you'll remember that the Corinthian church wasn't like that. You remember, they were divided against each other. They fought with each other over everything, especially over who was the most holy and who was the greatest spiritually gifted. They tore each other down. They took each other to court. The church in Corinth was not what I would call a friendly church. That's why Paul wrote to them and why he visited them. And you'll remember from last week's sermon that after the Apostle Paul wrote to them the letter which we call 1 Corinthians, He visited them. He intended to visit them twice, but he changed his plans because the visit had been a bad one. And the visit he had with Corinth was so bad that he decided not to come back again a second time. So he thought that if he went back and visited again, they'd just have another fight. And all that would be more conflict and another bad, painful visit. So he stayed away instead and he wrote them a letter, uh, which is often referred to as the severe letter, to hopefully address the problems and resolve the fighting. You remember this, right, from last week, I hope? And you'll remember that I told you last week that part of the issue between Paul and the Corinthians was his surprise. That he, he expected to arrive in Corinth and find that they would read his letter, that they would recognize and understand it, and that it was from godly instruction, and that they would put it into practice completely. That was his expectation, but what he actually had found was that nothing had changed that they had misunderstood what he wrote, that everything was completely the same, and that nothing he said was put into practice. 
But that last statement, nothing he said was put into practice, is not entirely accurate. Because there was one piece of instruction from Paul's letter that the Corinthians had wholesale embraced. One thing Paul had written to them that they understood and that they were gung-ho, full speed, 100% doing, but in a misunderstood way. And he talks about this issue here in verse 5. He says to them, If anyone has caused you grief, he has not so much grieved me as he's grieved all of you. To some extent, not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love to him. You see, if you remember... Way back in our study of 1 Corinthians, one of the issues Paul addressed was the issue of sexual immorality in the church in Corinth. They were proud of themselves because they were so tolerant of sin that they even had no problem with a guy who attended church there who was sleeping with his stepmother. You remember this now, right? Okay, now you remember the story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he told them that they're boasting about this was not good, and that instead they should have been in mourning over this sin. And he told them that in this instance, they should put the guy who was doing this out of their fellowship. He told them that they should expel the wicked person from among them. He told them they should kick the dude out of the church. He also told them in 1 Corinthians 5.11 that they should not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. He said, don't even eat with such people. And 100,000 years ago when we were in 1 Corinthians, we spent a great deal of time discussing how the reason for these instructions was for the good of everybody involved. We talked about how sin should not be tolerated because a little bit of sin grows and grows and grows and grows until it messes up huge, big things. So a little bit of sin tolerated will eventually affect the whole group. And if that sin was allowed, it would eventually infect everything. So for the good of everyone, that sin needed to be confronted. And we saw that they were to put that sinful person out of their fellowship for that person's good in hopes that such a drastic action would shock the person back to reality and cause them to repent and stop their sinful behavior. That was the instruction he wrote them in the first letter. And what we see from what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians is that the process had worked. Now, it may be that in this section, Paul is specifically talking about the guy he talked about in the other letter, about the guy who was sleeping with his stepmother, or there may be some other situation he's referring to, that we don't know about. But the point is, the process of taking drastic reaction to deal with sin worked. The Corinthian leaders had decided, even though it seems from what Paul writes here that maybe they weren't all in agreement because he talks about the majority deciding to do this, but they listened to his instruction and put the person out of fellowship. They had taken drastic action. And apparently, it worked. Paul says the punishment was sufficient. For this person, it snapped him awake to the wrong behavior he was doing. He repented and stopped the behavior. The process had worked. The one instruction that they took from Paul had worked. The problem was, the Corinthians liked this instruction a little too much. They were more than willing to condemn people as evil and excommunicate them from the church. And even when the process did work and the person did repent, they still wouldn't reconcile with the person. So Paul writes to them here to point out that they had missed the point. They got the letter, of, they got the instruction down, they did exactly what he said, but the point was to bring the person back. So now, for this guy, instead of continuing to keep him out, Instead of keeping it out, they should see that the process worked, that he had come to repentance, and as a result, they should go to him, forgive him, comfort him, and reaffirm their love to him and bring him back into the fellowship. The process had worked, but they had misunderstood. 
The point of his instruction wasn't in the putting the person out. The point of the instruction was in the end result, the bringing the person back in in repentance, bringing them back into the family, and they had missed that. So Paul says, it's time to let go of all that and bring the guy back in. He says in verse 9, the reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. They had listened, but only understood partially. So he writes to them again to point to them out, point out to them that the true intention of instruction was the reconciliation of the sinner to God and the family of God together. You see, they were almost there. They just needed to be obedient in everything and accept the repentant man back into their fellowship. He says to them in verse 10, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. So if they forgive the person, Paul isn't going to hold anything against that person. The matter is settled. There's no record of wrong. It is not our place to hold on to a sin on someone else's account, especially if that person is repentant. And why? Why should we forgive and not hold on to grievances against one another? Well, he says in the continuation of that verse, and what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now, we saw in 1 Corinthians that a big part of Satan's plan is to divide the people of God against each other. That's what Satan wants to do. But what Paul says here is we're not going to be stupid. Satan is not going to outwit us. We're not going to be unaware of what he's trying to do. We're going to see through his schemes to divide us and work against his schemes by forgiving and reconciling with each other. That's why we don't hold on to things. That's why we forgive each other. Because when we don't, we work into the hand of Satan and help him accomplish his plan. Paul says to the Corinthians, the process had worked. It had brought the sinner to repentance. It's time to stop holding on to the wrong. Let it go and bring the guy back in. Now, what should we learn from this passage of Scripture? First, we are far too often naive to the schemes of Satan. This is especially true when it comes to his plans to divide us. Too often, the church and the church people are willing to divide and be divided over our grievances. That is stupid. When you hold on to something against another child of God, you are working for Satan. You may feel that in your piousness, you are holding them to a high standard. What you are doing is working with Satan to help divide the church. We need to be wise to the schemes of Satan and not allow him to trick us and divide us. A lot of the time, we're too much like the Corinthians. We're far too willing to divide and and put people out who seem lesser or unholy or whatever they do to not meet our standard. But we miss the point. The point is reconciliation. Often, if you ask everybody outside the church how they view Christians as judgmental and unforgiving. That tells us we've missed the point. See, there is purpose in not associating with sin. Because a little bit of sin tolerated can work its way through the whole thing, and what was little can become a big, huge problem. And the Bible says that there is a value in not associating with the person who's sinful to shock them awake and try to bring them back to the reality of their wrong behavior in hopes that they'll turn back in repentance to God. And we mess this up a lot. And we we tend to mess this up both ways. A lot of the time, the people of God just don't speak out against sin when it's present. We tolerate sin. We make excuses. We don't want to seem judgmental. We don't want to seem, uh, you know, 
intolerant. We, want to, we, we make sin out to be no big deal. We don't point out the truth of the reality of sin, that it is rebellion against God's way, and that when you let it stay there, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. We see this around us all day. Sin, that people don't understand the severity of their sin. They don't realize the significance of their sin because the people of God haven't stood up and said, hey, this is a serious deal. In fact, often we can continue to associate with some sins as if they were our best friend. So we mess it up by being silent and tolerating sin sometimes, but also we see the people of God mess up the other side too. We see them act like the Corinthians. We declare sin is sin and we don't associate with sin. We divide, get away from it, put those people out so far away that they can't possibly have a chance to come back. See, both sides of that are wrong and a misunderstanding like the Corinthians fell into. And the, as the people of God, we need to work and be vigilant so we don't drive our car off into either ditch on either side of the road. You see, Paul is working to this point. He's eventually going to bring it up in a few chapters. He's going to complete it in a few chapters where he tells the readers that we, as the people of God, have been given what he calls the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what is reconciliation? Paul's going to tell us in chapter 5 that the ultimate expression of reconciliation is God reconciling the world to himself, bringing the world back to himself. God bringing sinners back to himself through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But he's also going to tell us that God uses us to make his appeal of reconciliation to the world. So we're the message carriers of that message. And this means a few things. First, in order for reconciliation to take place, there are two steps. One, the divide must be recognized. And two, the divide must be mended. So first, the divide must be recognized. In order for people living in a way that has divided them away from God to reconcile back to God, they have to understand that there is a division. If they don't see that they are apart from God, they can't possibly understand that that divide needs to be fixed. If a person doesn't understand the severity and dangerousness of their sin, they will never see it as a problem that needs to be fixed. And since God is using us to reconcile the world to himself, part of our job is to expose the serious nature of sin. This means that when it comes to sin, we cannot equivocate or compromise. We need to understand that any divergence from the way a person ought to live according to God is the most dangerous thing imaginable. It endangers their soul for eternity. If your child was about to touch their hand on a hot stove, you would yell at them because you see that as a serious thing. Sin is more serious than that. And we need to see all sin that way. We often say, well, no sin is worse than any other sin. So in God's eyes, a murderer isn't worse than someone who lies. That's true. But it also works the other way, you know. No sin is lesser than any other sin. So lying is just as bad as killing someone. This is true of all sin, and we need to have a proper view of it, including our own sin in our own lives, including the sin that we every day pass off as no big deal. It's our job to make sure that all sin and every sin is seen for what it is and how serious it is. Recognizing the divide between us and God is the first part of the process of reconciliation. And the other step is mending the divide. The word we typically use for mending the divide is repentance. Repentance means a change of direction. It means to be going one way, to stop, turn around, and go the other way. The Bible tells us that when a person does this, when a person is living their own way, they stop, they turn around, and instead they live God's way, God is ready to forgive. When a person repents and turns back to God, he is right there waiting to accept them back. And since God is using us 
to reconcile the world to himself, part of our job is to express this to them as well. Obviously, we should be telling them the message and showing them the message of how amazing God's forgiveness of sin is. That God, like the father in the story of the prodigal son, comes running down the road to welcome anyone who would come back to bless and celebrate with the sinner who turns back. We should have that same attitude towards a repentant sinner. But also, we shouldn't be like the Corinthians. If God forgives the person and accepts them back in their repentance, we have to forgive them and accept them back too into the family. Since God has brought them back, it's not our place to keep them out and remain unreconciled. It's not our job to do that. It's our job to help them see the depth of their sin, but it's also our job to help them see the depth of the Father's love for them and his readiness to accept them back into the family. We need to be the image of that message to them, ready to accept them back. And the biggest way we fulfill this purpose in the ministry of reconciliation is being reconciled to each other. I will say that again. The biggest way we fulfill this purpose in the ministry of reconciliation, the way we show the world that God's ready to forgive them and accept them back, is by being reconciled to each other. We've talked in the past about how the Corinthian church is divided, how the Christian church continues to be divided against itself, and how individual believers hold on to offenses against and grudges against each other. If we want to be the people of God, if we want to be people who follow Jesus, if we really want to do that, if we want to fulfill our role in the ministry of reconciliation, we cannot be people who continue to divide against each other. We must be reconciled to each other. We absolutely cannot hold on to things that divide us from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Right there is the reason why the Christian church is ineffective. Now, don't stop listening to me. The reason the Christian church is not what it should be is because we divide against each other. And I'm not just talking about the Lutherans against the Presbyterians or the Protestants against the Catholics or the Arminians against the Calvinists. No, one-on-one, -on -one, we still divide against each other too. And that's why we're ineffective, because they hurt us. Because they mistreated us. Because I don't think they're good enough or holy enough. Because I don't like them or because, because, listen to me, there is no because. God accepts them and loves them. Our Lord Jesus says, forgive them. Spiritual growth people, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? He's your boss. He tells you what to do. He forgives them. He says, forgive them. So you have no right to hold on to that offense. If God has forgiven something and you continue to hold on to it, you are declaring that you have a higher standard than God and that God is wrong in his standard. You don't want to be in that place. Remember, remember I just said a minute ago, we need to view sin as a serious thing? Do you know what it is when you say you have higher standards than God? That's putting yourself in the place of God. In the Bible, that's called blasphemy. When you hold on to offenses and divisions that God has reconciled, you are declaring yourself to be God. And also, don't miss the part where Paul says that if they forgive something, he forgives it too. We can't hold on to offenses against someone else, especially if they've forgiven it. We have to be reconciled to each other. You know, Paul, a while ago you were doing the thing where you, you know, be excellent to each other. I think maybe we need to start a new saying, and we'll do it with the other hand, and we'll say, be reconciled to each other. It's the same category. If we forgive, we forgive. We have to forgive. We have to be reconciled because God has forgiven. So we don't have the right to hold on to it anymore. Whatever the issue is, 
it is first and foremost an offense against God, not you. And Paul says that if they forgive, he does too. God's forgiven. We see that in what Jesus did. Therefore, unless you are above God, you have to forgive and be reconciled too. If we're divided against each other, if we refuse to reconcile with our brothers and sisters, what is the world going to think when they look at us? I'll tell you what they think, because it's what they see today. They'll, they think we're judgmental. They think we're unforgiving. They think we're hypocrites. Well, they'll, they'll know we're Christians by our love, right? What is the message about the reconciliation of God through Jesus going to mean to those outside if they look at us and see us not even willing to forgive each other? We must be reconciled to each other. I hope you understand the significance of this. This is why the church is ineffective. Because they look at us and they see us as liars. Because they, say, they hear us saying, God loves you and God wants to forgive you and back, bring you back in, but then we keep each other apart. They say, you're not going to fool me. I see how you live. We need to be reconciled to each other. Now, this is such a serious thing that today, right now, we're going to do something a little different. What's going to happen right now is the worship band is going to come on the stage and they're going to come and play a closing song. And, and they're going to make the introduction to this song a little longer than it usually is. And I know that you all like this song. And I know you all want to sing this song. And that's great. But right now, in this moment, reconciliation, coming together, is more important. So this song is the time to be reconciled to your brother and sister in Christ. When the music starts... We are all going to assume an attitude of prayer. Ask God to show you areas that you need to address. And when the music starts, before the song is over, if you know that there's a person you've wronged, you go to them right now and you seek reconciliation. If you are holding something against someone else, you go to them right now and you seek reconciliation before the song is over. If there's a sin that someone has committed that you haven't forgiven, right now you go and seek reconciliation. Even further than that. If, I was going to say if there's a person, but I guess there could be a whole bunch of people. Some, some people are going to have to move a lot on what we're doing right now. If there's a lot of people you're, you're, you have something against or have something against you, you got to do some moving here before, before the song's over to seek reconciliation. But if there's a person who is not here right now, when the music starts, Listen to me, you're going to have a shock. Take out your phone. And before the song is over, you seek reconciliation with that person. It is that important. And if there is someone who isn't here and you can't contact them before the song's over, that is not God saying you are off the hook. Before this day is over, seek reconciliation. We need to do this to be the people of God. When the music starts, I expect to see people moving. It's time to stop putting ourselves above God. It's time to repent of our sinfulness in holding on to grievances against our brothers and sisters. It's time to forgive. It's time to stop allowing Satan to divide us. We're not going to be stupid anymore. It's time to come together. So go now and seek reconciliation.